Okay? So let me just put that into perspective for you. A soldier, before you join the army, it's a, it's a rigorous uh, medical that they go through and requirement, you know? If we Royal Navy, all these things, don't think they, they, they require, we do the medicals in the, in the, in the physical. Their medical is very, very tough. If you mention mental health, you're out. Don't even want to hear about that. So apart from their strenuous exercises and regime and discipline, they give up. They give up a lot of things. Some of them good, some of them bad. Okay. The, the, so what some of the bad things they can give up is, the first one is pride, independence, self-will. They give it up. Now, some of the good things that they give up, they give up their home, they leave their family. Some of them are married. They have hobbies that they were following. Some of them, you know, go to football matches and things like that. They can't have that anymore. They give it up. That is what it takes you to be a soldier. So they give up everything. So, but if a soldier is not willing to give up these things, he is not a soldier at all. So he went the wrong profession. So you can see that this, these guys' minds are quite hardened. That's why when you see them, you know, they, nothing touches them easily they, because they're hardened already. So can we be hardened for Christ in that way? That is the question. So we continue. So in essence, we are talking about the soldier giving up a lot of things in order to serve as a soldier. And we are soldiers for Christ's army. We are putting a paralleling ourselves, comparing how well we can do in this field. So he must give up everything that gets in his way of being a good soldier and serving his commander, commanding officer. In every, every army, they have their officer, they are ranked. Yeah? Yeah, they are ranked. So there's always a commanding officer. So a faithful soldier does not have the right to do anything that will entangle them and make them less effective as a soldier. They don't do that. They run away from it. Because otherwise it will disqualify them. And they don't want to be disqualified. It's a very proudful, you know, profession. They want to be, you know, seen to show that they can, you know, withstand the test. So they are very proudful people, the, the army, army people, soldiers. Right. Now, the other thing it says there is that, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. There's always somebody who enlisted him. Yeah? Yes. So, so if Timothy did not endure hardship, and if he did not put away the things that entangled him in the affairs of this life, he would not be pleasing to his commanding officer. Who is the commanding officer? The commanding officer is Christ. Yeah. But also, let me use this opportunity to tell you that even in our own life out, out of ministry, there are times whereby you need to please your commanding officer. There will be other commanding officers that you need to please. Yeah. In the, in, in, even in, in, in our Christian journey, there are three fronts that we are usually judged. One is in the body, the ministry that all of us are brethren in. The other one is in the community. And the, the most important one is home, home, where you're coming from, where you and your wife lives. Okay? Yeah. So... If it is your wife who introduced you to Christ, she's your commanding officer. You need to please her. Yes, you need to please her. In fact, I would advise that let the, the, the wives be the commanding officers, which they are usually are. We are not contending the men, because in this area they will beat us. In your workplace, please respect your boss, because why I'm telling you this is that even if he's not a Christian, we've studied this before, you still need to respect them because your career might depend on them. Yes, for those of you who haven't worked long in this country, reference, somebody giving you a reference can do or break your career. Yeah, all we're working for is for reference. So make sure you are of good conduct and good character at your workplace. 
It's very important. We continue. Now, we've talked about the soldier. Now we'll come to the athlete. Verse 5. I'm still talking about persevering for the work of God. And it says, And also, if anyone competes in athletes, uh, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. They, they underline the rules. The rules. Yeah? Yes. So we often see Apostle Paul drawing attention to, you know, sports. You know, he did it here. He mentioned about, uh, you know, things like boxing in Second in First Corinthians 9.26 and also wrestling in Ephesians 6.12. Yeah, he, 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 there's a reason why he's using a, a, athletics and sport, sporting activities to give us uh, some uh, you know, references here. Now, let me just tell you this. It is possible to fall into the mistake of thinking that we can make up our own rules for our Christian life. Yeah? Yeah, some people might say, oh, let me just... Uh, do this. I know it's a sin, but it's between me and God anyway. Nobody's sin. So you, you make your own rules. Yeah? It's, it's a very dangerous thing to do. Don't do it because God is seeing everything. Yeah. You will not be pardoned for that. Yeah. Don't, don't twist your own rule. Or maybe, you know, uh, you, you set up a particular way of serving God because we think it's a better way that is not in the Bible. And you say, oh, God will understand. At the end of the day, we are mentioning his name. That is, you are not sticking to the rules. That's what we're talking about here. So you must compete according to the rules. And the rules are very, very clear. The rules are mapped out in the Bible. If we are confused, we open the Bible, the rules are there. The rules of engagement. So let us not, not try to change the rules. Let us stick to the rules that are laid down to us already. And that takes us to the farmer. The farmer. Yeah? Unlike the soldier and the athlete, there is nothing glamorous about somebody being a farmer. Yeah? The farmers, they always work long hours. It's a tedious job. It's boring. And it's not even exciting. Yeah? They always dress dirty anyway. So there's nothing really very, very glamorous about being a farmer. In fact, the, next, the nation's best farmers, they are not celebrities. So they really, really, they are not, uh, there's nothing to talk about them. But again, they work hard. They work hard for their money. Yes, they work hard. They do long hours. Even sometimes those of us from Africa, you know, you know what the sun can do. And in Africa, there's no shelter, so they work under the sun. This place might be better. They do mechanized farming. In Africa, they go out with tools in the morning and come back in the evening. The, the farmer works hard. So, so when we're talking about working hard, Paul knew the value of working hard. You know, he said in, in, in 1 Corinthians 15.10, I labored more abundantly than they. He knows, Paul knows, he has worked hard. That's what had in his life. Yeah. So if we continue in that uh, first Corinthians, he said, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. So again, this labor, Apostle Paul is even saying that it is not by his own making. It is by the grace of God that enabled him to work as hard as he should. So that verse continues to say, uh, he's talking about partaking of the, uh, of the crops. Now, when Timothy has spiritual food, or any pastor has spiritual food to give to the audience, they, they themselves usually test that food first, okay, before the congregation. So if he wasn't being fed from the word of God, you would, wouldn't really feed others. So it's always important, you know, just like pastors gives a message on on you know, Sundays, he first of all partake of that before he can bring it to, to, to the wider congregation to, 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 to sort of um, enjoy. So that's what the Bible is saying there, must be the first to partake of the crops. Okay? Um, and and I, 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 I need to tell you something about that as well. When it comes in, even in terms of the teaching I'm doing to you now, 
we will find out that an, an effective pastor or teacher will get more out of the message than the audience does because we do take time to prepare for these things. And each time you are taking in it is a time spent with God. That's why we encourage everybody to read their Bibles. Yeah, because this is the Bible, the God's word is live. So you can see that the concentration and, and how you carry yourself when you study the word of God is, is different. You don't want distractions. You, don't, you want to understand what you're studying. You want to take it in. So... That's another reason to, to encourage all of you to, to sort of keep, keep studying. And uh, partaking of that crop as well, uh, like a good farmer, any godly pastor will work hard and he will, you know, patiently await the harvest. Yeah? Does the harvest happen straight away? No, the harvest will not happen straight away. It does take time. But don't be discouraged if you don't get the harvest straight away. Yeah, it does take time to get the harvest. And the harvest is according to God's will. We move on. Verse 7 it says, Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Yeah? Yes, yeah, so that is our wish, really, that the Lord Almighty will give us understanding in all things. So when we look at that, Paul has just illustrated the, you know, the life of a Christian compact. So, you know, the, the soldier, you know, the athlete, the farmer, okay? Now he's trying to encourage that may the Lord give us, you know, all understanding in, in all things. So we need, we need this understanding because without God's understanding, we wouldn't be able to actually achieve much. Like, 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 like there, you know, as we said, if the soldier stops fighting before the battle is finished, he will never see the victory. Or rather the athlete, if he doesn't follow the rules, he'll be disqualified. Or the farmer, if he stops working before the harvest is complete, he will not see the fruit of his, of his labor. So we are encouraged to, to continue and that the Lord will give us understanding in all things. Yeah, because there's a lot of things that we don't know. And we pray that the Almighty God will give us understanding in them. And we'll continue. Uh, verse 8 talks about, uh, say, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Right. Now, simply there, reminding us that Jesus was from the seed of uh, David is trying to tell us that, you know, he was, you know, human. Yeah? Yeah. So the statement means that he was fully human. Raised from his dead means that Jesus was fully God. Okay, so that is your understanding. Otherwise, the human being, there's no human that we've seen that have died before and raised on their own. If they are raised, they are raised by the power of God. So it's only God who can do resurrection. So that is just specifically what that means. And we remember that the word gospel means good news. Yeah, For Paul, the best news was not about money, love, or more status, or, or, or any other thing. The good news was about a real relationship with God through the finished work of Christ in the cross of Calvary. That, that was for him the good news. That's why he said there, my gospel. Yeah? So that, that, is, that is his gospel. That should be my and yours gospel. To have a full understanding about this good news. We continue, verse nine. He says, "For which I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even to the point of chains." But the word of God is not chained. Now, for which I suffer. Now, Apostle Paul is trying to tell Timothy that uh, I'm going. To, this thing has locked me off. Um, yeah. So Apostle Paul is trying to tell Timothy here that, um, you know, the gospel life is not going to be a glamorous life. It's going to be a life that will be full also with sufferings. Just to encourage him of what will come his way at some stage. So, so that he will not be disappointed if, if any of that sort of thing happens. Um, in fact, as I said, during that time Paul was in prison, a lot of horrible things happened, you know, uh, in the in in in, the, in that city, um, even you know people were killed, you know alive, 
wild animals we are just used to kill people and while other people watch so it was all terrible sort of terrible things that happened but there is the significance here of him saying the, the significance of chain when, when we look at what happened to apostle paul there we could view it as a a chained messenger with an unchained word okay although he was chained but the word of god could not be chained he was still able to release the word of God. He was still able to write this book. So the word of God cannot be chained. That's one thing. Yeah? So in as much as he was bound in prison, who knows, he could have been chained to another soldier to make sure that he doesn't run away. But the word of God could not be chained. And that, uh, that trend continues even up to today. Okay? History has shown us that the Bible has been attacked, you know, more than any other book in history. Okay? Yes, the Bible has been burnt in some countries. It has been banned in some countries. It has been mocked in some countries, twisted by some false teachers, and ignored. But the word of God still stands forever. Yes, nobody can... can, can extinguish the Bible from this earth. Look at what Isaiah 48 says. It says, the grass withers, the flowers fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The word of God cannot be silenced. People might try, if you go to the areas, all these people, communist countries, where they don't know God, they, if you bring the Bible, they will bungle you and put you in prison. But has that stopped the flow of the Bible? No. Missionaries still smuggle Bibles and give people to read. People still get access to Bibles. Yeah? The word of God is not chained. No government, no religious authorities, no skeptics, no scientists, no philosophers, no book burners have been able to stop the work of the word of God. Let me tell you what, where we have problem. Where we have problem is supposedly to be us who we know the word. We are trying to bound the word. We are not releasing the word to go out. That is where the problem is. If the whole people, like we are, are spreading the word much quicker, it, the word will not have problem. It is often the people that are supposed to be friends of the word that bounds it. Are we doing enough to spread the word of God? We continue. Therefore, I endure, verse 10, I therefore endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation. Now, it is very, very ironical there. You would have thought that uh, Apostle Paul would have said he endures all things for the sake of God. He didn't say so. He said he's enduring it for the sake of the elect. Okay? So this, this is showing us the measure of his love for God's people. Yeah. Showing us the measure of God for his love people. It just shows you how, you know, this guy is just selfless, really. Yeah. So Paul's life was not spent merely in getting people rescued in Christ, but also in seeing them grow and become complete in their relationship with God. That's, 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 that's really what he, what he was happy with. Yeah, it's, it's no good serving people because salvation is one thing, but growing in the Lord is another thing. So when you go through that journey, you need discipleship. You need people to guide you, to get you going, to get you matured so that you, 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 you will stand strong in, what, in, in, in the way you serve God. Verse um, 11 to 13, it just looks like more like a hymn, a hymn of faithfulness, okay? Um, it says, it, 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 it said this is a faithful saying, for if we, if we die with him, we shall also live with him. Okay, so let's take that, that sentence first of all. If we die with him, we shall also live with him. Now, the Bible speaks of dying with Jesus in at least two ways, yeah? One is 
the one is illustrated by baptism. Romans, if you want, want to again see the meanings of baptism, you go to Romans 6, 3 to 5. Okay, you will see the act of baptism, what it means when you dip yourself into that water, when you are under the water, and when you rise again. Just trying to imitate what Christ did. We died and resurrected again with him. Okay? But it can also mean martyrdom, that in the course of your service to Christ, you were martyred, you were killed. Okay? I think probably that is what uh, the more stronger argument here that in the, in the course of you serving Christ, that you might actually lose your life as well. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's something that we need to be aware of. Right. The Bible says that if we endure, we shall also reign with him. The whole thing we are talking about being a farmer, an athlete, a soldier, is all about endurance in the service of God. But it's, the Bible is promise, promising us here that if we do so, that we will also reign with him. Yeah? Yes. This is an, a, 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 a faithful assurance of, of the believer of our eternal reward if we persevere and if we endure to the end. Yeah. Uh, so this principle assures us that our present difficulty or trial is what enduring for. Yeah, because the reward that is coming is greater. That's, 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 the, that's the way to look at it. So, you know, if you quit, you lose everything. Yeah, let us continue. Let us endure. The reward that is coming is greater. So, it's greater than what we will gain. We will not gain anything if we quit. Let us continue. We encourage to continue. But it's also sounded a warning that if we deny him, he will also deny us. Okay? I pray that we will not deny him. Um, so the song warns those who deny Jesus that they will be denied. Matthew 10.33. Matthew 10.33. It says, Jesus said this plainly, that whosoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. I don't think I don't pray that this will be our, any of our portion in Jesus' name. If we've come so far, we cannot deny Christ. Yes, we will see it to the end. Yeah, the last this thing that says, if we are faithless, He remains faithful. God is always faithful, even in our shortcomings. We are faithless. We can disappoint Him. We can do anything we 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 we, we do we do to little faith, but God remains faithful. It doesn't change. And it, it doesn't change. So that's, that's, that's reassuring to know that it doesn't change. So we'll continue. Verse 14. It's a, verse 14 is just encouraging us to keep focused. Yeah? Yeah. That we shouldn't be distracted by unprofitable things. So the Bible says, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Okay? So, now, the church, you know, the church is, all, it is changing, especially with the, you know, with the way people worship now, and with the way the society has changed, has also put some uh, pressure on the church. So the church is constantly tempted to get its focus off the message that really matters. And is tempted to become like, sometimes people from outwardly can, can even see us like an, an entertainment area. When they see us dancing away, they say, ah, these people, they are being entertained. The church also have been, so somehow, take it or not, could actually become an area where, where benefit issues will be discussed because people would problems come to the church to get it solved, yeah? And, uh, you know, a place where people will definitely come to be healed. That's what, what, that's what we are for. So, you know, the role of the church keeps, you know, keeps changing. The church also have taken up some of the uh, social services work sometimes, trying to have pastoral job to the elderly at home. 
Yeah, the social service is supposed to be doing that as well. So the church's uh, role has, you know, changed over the, over the years to incorporate more, more things these days, you know, more social, social activities as well. Um, so it's talking to them, but to remember these things, what are these things that, we're, that he's talking about here? You know, Second Timothy 2, 8, where we just passed, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed, was of the seed of David and was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Again, these things of Second Timothy two eleven to thirteen, where we have just finished, that was reminding us that if we died with him, we shall also we shall also you know live with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So these things, you know, we shall remember them. We shall remember them constantly because they are going to be to, to help us. But he warned us not to strive about words, you know, words to no profit. What this was of no profit is that the church must stand for the truth, that it must not become a debating society. It's not the church is not a place where people come to have arguments or debate about things endlessly and not, not achieve anything at the end. Because if we do that, we, we risk getting distracted from the focus. Yeah, so we really want to make sure that this sort of argument doesn't really destabilize us. And if there are issues, we shall just nicely iron it out, but not derail from the focus. Yeah, not derail from the focus. So, so God's purpose is not to pander our inquisitiveness, but to give us what profitable instruction. So, and that's, that comes through the word, the word of God that we shall we need to be careful about what we release, what we talk about with people, especially when it comes to arguments. Now, he's saying there to, ruin, to the ruin of the hearer. Now, if we take the focus off the message of God and put the focus on human opinion and endless debates, then it will result in ruining the hearer. Just imagine somebody attended our, our church for the first time, and there we are arguing away for things that are not... Uh, not uh, really profitable. It will, it will, um, it will um, not go very well with that person. Yeah, they will just think, what is, what is this about? So we need to, we need to stay away from that. And uh, the Bible also reminded us of in Roman ten seventeen, Roman ten seventeen, said the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay. Yet, if people do not hear the word of God, you know, then ruin comes by hearing the opinion and the speculation and the entertainment of men. Yeah, we ruin them by our own opinion and our own entertainment if we didn't let them hear the word of God. So we need to make sure that we stay away from that. Praise the Lord. I will do verse 15. We'll do verse 15 and then we'll stop there and uh, take some questions if anybody has any question and then some or additions or, and then take some prayer points. Okay, verse 15 says, it says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? Be diligent. The whole thing we're talking about today is all about diligence, perseverance, hard work. Be diligent. Apostle Paul is telling Timothy again to be diligent. Now, he's also instructed him to present himself approved to God. Approved to God. Okay? Timothy's goal was not to present himself approved to people, but approved to God. So today, whose approval are you seeking? when you carry out the, the issues of service in the church? Do you have, have seek the approval of you know, your pastor who has ordained you or the overseer of the Royal Christian Center or the other pastors? Are you seeking the approval or are you seeking the approval of God? Are you seeking the approval of that brother who, who you think uh, you need to impress or that sister? 
we need to seek the approval of God. It's only God and God alone. So the, the, the job of a pastor should not be regarded as a, 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 a popularity contest. We should, we should only seek the approval of God. You say, present yourself approved to God, yeah? So we've said it again. Um, well, he first had to present himself, not others. There is a sense to present yourself first before presenting others. Yeah? Yeah. I think you need to do that. Leave others to present themselves, but present yourself first. Present yourself first. A worker who's, who does not need to be ashamed. Yeah? Yeah. Do you know, this is shame we're talking about. It's all about when your work is examined, are you going to be ashamed of what you did or not? Yeah? We know now we have the CQC who does inspection in care homes, in other you know, companies, and they're just wanting to maintain standard. Just want to maintain standard. Some people do very badly in those inspections because they're not prepared or they don't actually know. They don't have a handbook on how to prepare to get a good inspection. But we have a handbook that contains what we need to do so that when our jobs are examined, we should not be ashamed of what we have done. If Christ comes today to examine your work, will you be ashamed or not? That's a personal question. I, I also have been wondering about my own self. So you go ahead and answer that question for us. During, you know, go and meditate on it. The, for the Bible have reminded us in 2 Corinthians 5.10 that the work of each Christian will be examined at the judgment seat of Christ. It, it is something that is going to happen. It's not a joke. So make sure you are not ashamed when your work is revealed. The other thing we need to look at there is he said, rightly dividing the word of truth. Yes. So are you rightfully dividing the word of truth? Again, this is an emphasis mainly to the pastors, but also myself who is teaching the word of God. Are we dividing the word of truth? Are we dividing it rightly? So this means you need to know what it says and what it didn't say. There's no, it cannot add or remove. Also, we need to know how it was to be understood and how it was not to be understood, the word of God. Yeah? Now, let me just make a comparison between the word of God and sword. People use sword to cut, to hack, to wound, and to kill. The word of God is used not to kill, but it can be used to prick men's heart it's not going to kill them, but it's going to kill the sin in them. To kill the sin in them. So let, let, let us use it always to kill the sin and bring the poor to salvation. The word of God should not be used by some ministers for glamour and glitter and fail to deliver his purpose. Because some people think, you know, when you watch some people who think that they are men of God, they're just doing entertainment without really stressing and hitting on what the word says. So the word should not be used like that. So when we look at the, the meaning of rightly dividing, you know, in ancient times, you can actually be to, to be rightly handling the word of God as one would handle a sword, which I have given you an example. It, it, it also explains that it could, be, it could be meaning to plow threat with the word of God, properly presenting the essential doctrines. You could also look at it as properly dissecting and arranging the word of God as the priest dissects and arranges, arranges animal for sacrifice. But we can also see it as 
an allotment whereby, you know, an allotment is allotted to each portion to one person. Because when, when the word comes, you know, it, it can minister to some people in another way. There's something from that word can also minister to other people in another way. So we can actually, actually look at it at that, as an allotment. But there is also a right way and a wrong way to understand the Bible. And the pastor especially must work hard to master the right interpretation. You know, very often you see people saying, ah, this is my own interpretation. That is my own interpretation. There should be no different interpretations. The Bible has to be interpreted in one way and one way only. I will give you an example. Matthew 7, 1 says, judge not that you be not judged. Okay? Judge not that you be not judged. Right. So it's not saying you have no right to judge my behavior or anyone else's behavior. The correct understanding of Matthew 7, 1 is easily seen by actually reading Matthew 7, 2. When you read Matthew 7, 2, you will find out that it says, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So Jesus was just saying, don't judge anyone by a standard you, are, you yourself is not willing to be judged. This is, this, is, this is the important message. Yes, you judge them with a strict criteria, but when it comes to yourself, you want a, a more lenient criteria. Yeah? So God will hold you to the same standard you have held others. So this clearly does not forbid judging someone else, but it does prohibit doing it unfairly and hypocritically or living with a judgmental attitude. That's the one that is not good. And I will stop here. I will stop here. One thing I need to tell you, brethren, is that the Bible is huge. The Bible is, is a huge book. It's one of these books that, even if you like, go to theology school for 20 years, you will not be able to understand and master the Bible entirely. Maybe God has a, a purpose why he has done it like that, that we still need to come to him for an understanding. Ask the Holy Spirit to help us to understand. But that should not deter you from digging deep, digging deep. I pray that the word of God has been understood this evening. And we will start next week from verse 16. Okay? And hopefully finish, finish it uh, to, to the end. So I will uh, give people opportunity now to make comments or if you want to ask questions, you can go ahead before we pray. So you can unmute yourself if you have any question to ask or if you have any contributions to make so that we can uh, pray.